Namaste. Good morning, all of you. On behalf of Sri Venkateswara University, Tirupati, India, on my own behalf, I extend my warm welcome to all of you. This is Professor N. Savitramma, the Organizing Secretary of today's international webinar on role of nanotechnology in current scenario. My warm welcome to Professor Raja Reddy, the Vice Chancellor, Sri Venkateswara University, Professor Sundaravalli, Rector, Professor Hussein, Registrar, and the Director, Professor Sudarsanam, the Head of the Department, Sri Venkateswara University, and the Organizing Director of today's International Webinar. I also extend my welcome to my colleagues, research scholars and students, the delegates from all over the world and the participants from different fields. Today, I am very happy to be with you uh, at the international webinar. Myself and the director Professor Sudarsanam thought to share the knowledge of nanotechnology to our educational community because this era is a nanotechnology era. One should learn minimum things of nanotechnology because it's a widespreading in all our educational system in different fields. So in this context, the efforts made by the director, tediously uh, he gathered the participants and resource persons to share their knowledge to all of you. I welcome the participants from 21 countries around 1200s and this webinar definitely helpful to you all and share the knowledge of resource person and it definitely helpful uh, to pave the way to do the research in different aspects. The seminar was organized, sorry, the webinar is organized by the collaboration of University Bangalore, Indonesia and University Malaysia, Kalantan and the supported by University Malaysia, Saheb and MIT University, Pune, University Negri Medan, Unimet and the technology partners, Vegetech, Urban Kisan, Hydrilla, Sairam Capital, D Farm and media partner Agritech and Floriculture. So I, wel I welcome you all for today's webinar. All of us know very well that getting or gathering knowledge is very difficult. So it is a, a Herculean task to keep all the knowledge in a nutshell and the resource persons are ready to pour their efforts uh, for today's webinar and we are going to have a good feast and we learn definitely in the resource persons what they are collected and they are going to deliver in their talk. I welcome the resource persons Professor, uh, Dr. Paulson Sansai Abdullah, University Malaysia Kelantan, Dr. Pritam Bala, MIT ADT, University of Pune, and Visveswar Rao, he is the alumni of Sri Venkateswara University, at present he is the faculty of University of Malaysia Sabah, Dr. Huda Aveg, University Malaysia Kelantan, Dr. Mundur Zubir, 
University Negeri, Maiden, Indonesia. I extend my warm welcome to all resource person for today's webinar. Today's international webinar, which is organizing by the Department of Botany, Sri Venkateswara University. And once again, I extend my sincere welcome to you all and also best wishes. Very good morning. Today, 28th May 2021, our first speaker, Dr. Paulson Anasi Abdullah from University of Malaysia, Kalantan. Uh, he, he is well known for nanotechnology here, and then he is going to deliver a talk on synthesizing nanomagnetic absorbed compos composites from agro-biomass residues, consumer and industrial prospects. Welcome you, sir. Please deliver your talk. Good day. Greetings from Malaysia. I'm Paulson from the Faculty of agro -based Industry, University of Malaysia, Kelantan, Jelly Campus. A virtual welcome to all for our sharing on agrobiomass based nanomagnetic absorbent composites. Firstly, a big thanks to Prof. Sanam and his team from the Department of Botany at SV University for organizing this wonderful informative webinar. Our research sharing will be on some insights into synthesis, benefits, potential applications, challenges, and plan ahead. To start, let's look at some background information. What triggered the interest and the motive of this initiative? We've listed four main concerns here. In the local context, almost 70% of the water is sourced from groundwater. Ineffectiveness of filtration and clarification processes at water treatment plants lead to high turbidity and increased chemicals usage. This is more pronounced with normal filtration employing polymer media when turbidity is more than 20 NTU, as observed with groundwater. Polyaluminum chloride is used as substitute to alum and ferrous sulfate for portable water clarification. However, the higher quantity of polyaluminum chloride required can become very costly, can blind cell filters and have very narrow range of effective dose. Mixed waste and colored effluent released by cottage industries showed lower compliance rate to environmental quality standards and existing treatment methods, if any, are either non-accessible, too expensive or too technical, thus becoming less practical. On the other hand, the high use of chemicals, flocculating agents and other absorbents usually leads to heavy sludge generation, hence higher incidence of secondary pollution and sludge may be flushed into the waterways. Now, coming to our main player, of the 1.2 million metric tons of agro waste produced locally and 1.7 billion metric tons globally, over 70% are left to rot and disposed as trash. Well, isn't that a waste, waste being wasted? More than often, cleaning up means to gather all, pile up and carry out open burning. This leads to air, soil and water pollution, adverse health effects, and further deteriorates environmental and aesthetic quality. The vast development in the field of nanotechnology and applications of nanomaterials have been widely discussed in recent years. We know nanoparticle use offers many benefits and advantages due to its unique size and physical chemical properties. And surely, nanotechnology has been the buzzword within many industries ranging from biomedical and pharmaceutical health and medicine, biomaterials and advanced materials, electronics, robotics, and even clothing. Our areas of interest and its role in current scenario fall within potential applications in environmental, soil and agriculture, and personal care. For example, water consumption has increased for both consumer and industry. Water security is of concern not only in terms of quantity, but quality of surface 
groundwater resources. Alternative approaches in water and wastewater treatment and when dealing with mixed waste is of importance for both users and water solution providers. Water treatment facility operators are also looking at alternatives for both clarification and filtration. Aluminium-based coagulants are becoming costly and sensitive on working pH and temperature. Though most work with nanomaterials are being directed towards biomedical applications, nanomaterials have also been suggested as efficient, cost-effective and environmental-friendly alternative to existing adsorbent material for environmental remediation. Many reports on the use of nanoparticles like titanium dioxide, silica, silver, and even iron oxide itself are available in the literature. However, the use of nanoparticles in its free form in the open environment may not be the best approach. It will be difficult to recover the spent or used nanoabsorbent material and it's not going to be feasible to remove nanoparticles by filtration or centrifugation. Managed separation techniques have received considerable attention to address the separation problem. It can be employed in two ways. First, separation of magnetic target by an external magnetic field and secondly, separation of non-magnetic targets such as organic compounds through formation of a complex with magnetic particle which is then separated by an external magnetic field. This is certainly a better option as opposed to non-magnetic nanoparticles. Amongst materials with magnetic properties, iron oxide nanoparticles are the most suitable for various applications including environmental and generally regarded as safe. The nanostructure is based on the common inorganic core of iron oxides such as hematite, magnetite and megamite that have been the subject of intensive studies over the years. The three major iron oxide crystallite structures namely hematite, magnetite and megamite and the placement of iron 2 plus, iron 3 plus and oxygen 2 minus can be seen here. So, wouldn't it be advantageous to use iron oxide magnetic nanoparticles where one can recover the iron oxide with an external magnetic field? However, iron oxide magnetic nanoparticles have large surface to volume ratio and possess high surface energies. Coupled with high chemical activity, they are easily oxidized in air, especially magnetite, generally resulting in loss of magnetism and dispersibility. Due to this, stability issues are of concern when it comes to application, especially in solution like in water treatment. As such, iron oxide magnetic nanoparticles tend to aggregate to minimize the surface energies when dispersed in solutions also sensitive to surroundings condition like acidity. Competitive adsorption due to self-aggregation of iron oxide nanoparticles cause colloidal instability. Agglomeration makes separation difficult. Depending on the ultimate purpose of use, magnetic nanoparticles on their own are less suitable as adsorbents. These are clear limitations of using iron oxide magnetic nanoparticles in its free form. In order to optimize the synthesis of iron oxide nanomaterials in larger volumes, surface modification and medium modification are required. This modification could help produce stable magnetic nanoparticles which can resist oxidation and prevent self-aggregation. Thus, the need to develop a composite to explore, to find, and to have an organic platform to attach the iron oxide magnetic nanoparticles. Sharing uh, some common sites of agrobiomass or agro waste and their disposal. Here we can observe a stretch of coconut shells husk being burnt openly, these materials can be of value. With coconut shell, durian husk, sugarcane bagasse and many more agrobiomass residues. 
This will be our raw material source for biocarbon, obtained through thermal conversion by carbonization using top lid updraft carbonization drum. This essentially is a much cleaner process that prevents the release of toxic gases and compounds. Biocarbon is carbon rich, porous product with advantageous physical chemical properties produced relatively at a lower cost. Activation, if needed, was performed by boiling biocarbon in aqueous salt solution. Use of nitrogen or steam for activation was not required. The surface modified biocarbon derived from agro waste residues provide the much needed organic platform base. The biocarbon allows the attachment and binding of iron oxide magnetic nanoparticles. It functions as the backbone to stabilize the magnetic nanoparticles and provides structural frame for mechanical and property support. Importantly, biocarbon holds excellent absorption ability. If the technology can combine the advantages of cheap biocarbon and magnetic particles to fabricate new composite material with high surface area, appropriate pore size and magnetic separability, a promising normal adsorbent may be possible to be conceived. Much interest has since been towards the synthesis and use of magnetic nanoparticle composites. We focus on agrobiomass derived nanomagnetic adsorbent composites. The material is a combination of biocarbon generated from agrobiomass, like sugarcane baguettes, coconut shell, as the medium, which was then modified with iron oxide magnetic nanoparticles. Nanomagnetic adsorbent composite, or NMACOM, is composed of two main components a mix of agrobiomass derived biocarbon, the anchor the main bulk of the composite and is complemented with iron oxide magnetic nanoparticles. The attachment of the iron oxide magnetic nanoparticles give rise to the functional nanomagnetic absorbent composite. Now, moving on to synthesis, there are actually many reported works on iron oxide magnetic nanoparticles preparation and synthesis. This includes uh, microemulsion, thermal decomposition, hydrothermal synthesis, and co-precipitation, among others. As one convenient and cheap method, co-precipitation has the potential to meet the increasing demand for direct preparation of well-dispersed water-based iron oxide nanoparticles. This approach offers a low temperature alternative in the production of nanoparticles and better size control. Now, Synthesis of our nanomagnetic adsorbent composite was achieved through co-precipitation coupled carbonomagnetization method. The whole process actually can be done in a single stepwise procedure in open environment conditions. Simply put, this is a surface modification procedure where we allow the binding and attachment of iron oxide magnetic nanoparticles onto the biocarbon. The initial synthesis involved co-precipitation of the iron source in aqueous solution under mechanical stirring. Ammonium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide can be used as the reducing agent, followed by a series of temperature and time-dependent sequential heating and mixing, ranging from 30 degrees Celsius to 80 degrees Celsius. Biocarbon was added in the range of 3 to 5% weight by volume and mixed completely. The suggested particle size for the biocarbon is up to 300 microns. This is also dependent actually on the proposed final application use. Commercial activated carbon can also be used if preferred to substitute the self prepared agro biomass derived biocarbon. Stabilizers are optional but preferable, especially for large volume synthesis as to prevent aggregation. Our choices include Cross-linkers or surfactants such as epichlorohydrine, sodium dodecyl sulfate, citric acid, dimeticon, cetyl methyl ammonium bromide, and cyclopentaxilosine. This was followed by sonication before separation of the precipitate which was washed and collected via an external magnetic field. The biocarbon held the magnetic nanoparticles in place and importantly, no iron leaching was observed before or after use.
apart from the biocarbon particle size range. The other main factors that can affect the synthesis procedure are pH, temperature, agitation speed, and residence or curing time. The pH range during the synthesis of iron oxide magnetic nanoparticles is usually around pH 8 to 11. The effect of pH on the average particle size of the magnetic nanoparticles can be estimated from the Scherer equation of the X-ray diffraction peaks. Increasing temperature can also affect particle size distribution and polydispersity. Particle size decreased with increasing stirring or agitation rate. Particles dispersed into smaller droplets, higher agitation reduced growth kinetics, resulting in smaller sized particles. Sonication is suggested especially when dealing with large reaction volume. The larger particles can also be obtained by aggregation of these small crystallites. Example of XRD spectrum for sugarcane bagasse derived nanomagnetic adsorbent composite is shown here. The iron oxide nanoparticles were in the form of megamite. The sizes of the nanoparticles can be estimated from the XRD data using the Scherer equation, which gives a relationship between particle size and peak broadening by the given equation, where D is the particle size of the crystal, K is the Scherer constant, lambda is the X-ray wavelength, beta is the line broadening in radian obtained from the full width at half maximum and theta is the Bragg diffraction angle of the XRD diffraction patterns. EDX analysis also revealed the major constituent peaks for carbon, oxygen, and iron. Significant advantages of composite material can be summarized to the following features. It can be seen that magnetic properties enhance clarification filtration and removal of pollutants from water and reverse water. It can be multi-waste oriented, effective for the removal of both inorganics and organics. Absorption process is rapid due to nanoparticle coated modified surface, where absorption and separation time can be reduced by 80 to 90%, minutes versus hours with conventional agents. Magnetic biocarbon can then be conveniently separated by use of external magnetic field, hence is after use separation or recovery of spent material. And the material is reusable up to three to five cycles with more than 80% effectiveness retained with material recovery option. Up close with the hybrid composite material, responsiveness to external magnetic field was observed indicating super paramagnetism characteristic. Now, let's see the consumer industry's prospects. For water solution providers, we propose an all-in-one approach as opposed to individual treatment processes encompassing of flocculation, coagulation, filtration, and absorption using ACH, PAC, alum, or activated carbon. The use of nanomagnetic adsorbent composite as clarifying and filtering agent is forcing to ease turbidity and sludge issues by facilitating coagulation and separation of spent material. Now, to support our cause, we got the opportunity to meet our local water treatment provider at the treatment plant. Importantly, the chance to carry out a live demo on-site with real water sample, real time. Do note, the nanomagnetic adsorbent composites and the samples were used as it is. No prior filtration, pH, ionic strength or temperature adjustments were made and no additives, accelerants or catalysts were added. There you go, almost immediate. Now, let's see that again. Two nanomagnetic adsorbent composites of different particle sizes were used here for demonstration.
the spent composite can now be separated from the clear water and recovered with an external magnet for subsequent use. One of our team's achievements, bagging the Grand Winner Award at Tech Plant Demo Day for the Nanomagnetic Absorbent Composite. A gold medal for our Nanomagnetic Biocarbon Absorbent Composite product at the Nuremberg International Trade Fair, Germany. Here, the product also received interest from foreign water and wastewater treatment solution providers. However, we were not ready for commercialization as we haven't gone into mass production. My active field, an active filtering unit fabricated for a local textile operator for effluent treatment. This uses a mix of nanomagnetic biocarbon composite and activated carbon as its filtering matrix. Effluent readings showed that COD, BOD, TSS, TDS, metals, inorganics, and conductivity decreased by 63 to 87% and adhered to local environmental quality limits. My Magnifield, a consumer-centric magnetic filter unit prototype for use with nanomagnetic absorbent composites to be fixed at point of use or point of entry. As opposed to small amounts of nanomagnetic particles usually used for applications in biomedical and clinical field, a single environmental application run itself may require the material in kilogram, if not tons, to sustain the operation. Yes, this is good business, no doubt. But the biggest challenge would be to mimic laboratory preparation for mass production. We need to scale up the synthesis and surface functionalization of agrobiomass residues with iron oxide magnetic nanoparticles. Production conformity will be dependent upon technical methods which will determine the outcome of the final product in terms of size, shape, stability and dispersibility, which will then dictate product functionality. Last year, we managed to carry out a trial production run. We made do with available equipment, mixing tanks, sonicator, and a double jacketed reactor in batch mode. Production capacity was in the range of 100 to 120 liter per batch. We learned many things though. Much needs to be improved before a pilot production can be set up. Yield obtained was around 78 to 82% up to 6 kg per batch. It is essential to enhance the dispersion of the nanoparticles, prevent interparticles aggregation, and allow maximum concentration of the iron oxide magnetic nanoparticles to be in contact and attached to the biocarbon. All in all, we foresee a bright future ahead in the use of agrobiomass residues as the sorbent precursor medium in the form of modified biocarbon to produce nanomagnetic adsorbent composite. This 
could actually solve agro waste disposal problem. In addition, it is also expected to increase effectiveness and reduce operating costs of water purification and treatment and open up new areas for added value product development. We plan to mass produce nanomagnetic adsorbent composite for commercial application while making it a part of community driven initiative for their socio economic empowerment. Secondly, to develop affordable and competitive filter units for consumer industry use and to tap onto various potential fields such as energy production and storage. Future collaborations are most welcomed. The use of nanomagnetic azurean composite for aquaculture and soil rejuvenation are also being explored as well. Iron oxides are considered to be safe for use in cosmetics and personal care products because they are non-toxic and non-allergenic. Iron oxides are even well tolerated by those with sensitive skin. Here, we incorporate nanomagnetic in musker formulations to take up the anti-pollution skincare team. With that, thank you all for your kind attention. And again, thank you, Prof. Suda, for this wonderful initiative. Till we meet again. Hello. Our next speaker, Pritam Bala, from MIT, ADT, University, Pune. He's going to deliver a talk on novel nanoparticles for smart drug delivery system. Uh, welcome, you, sir. Please deliver your talk, sir. Good morning. Good morning, everyone present. Uh, I hope I'm audible to all of you present here. Uh, let me just start the video and share my screen uh, to present today's talk. Okay, so I hope I'm audible and the presentation is visible now. Fine. So uh, again, good morning to everyone present and uh, a very warm welcome to the talk that I'll be giving. Uh, before starting, I would really like to take this opportunity to thank uh, SLI Webcasting Center, uh, Department of Botany, uh, Sri Venkateshwara University, Tirupati, uh, for organizing this uh, amazingly well-structured event, uh, which is role of nanotechnology in uh, current scenario. So given this exact this current scenario, which is all around us, which is the pandemic situation that has affected the entire world, every family, every individual, we have lost many of our relatives, friends, mentors, many of our known associates which is a really a sad and terrible situation. So in this situation, to come up with this kind of conference, which serves many purpose. First and foremost, we get together and discuss something which is so crucially important, which is a nanotechnology, because this technology can be one of the window through which we can see and tackle this disease in a very different light. And this kind of conferences can be the common platform for a lot of collaborations and a lot of efforts uh, that can be initiated. So I would really like to thank again the entire organizing committee, the entire institution for putting this platform out there for all of us to discuss our and share our work. Having said that, uh, let's now get back to the talk that I'm supposed to deliver, which so my talk, as you can see in the current slide, is basically will be taking cue from the conference theme, which is the nanotechnology. And to check some of the opportunities that we can create. So in the name of novel nanoparticles, so how we can create some of the new ideas, new novel nanoparticles and kind of 
give a new light in terms of smart drug delivery. So that will be overall the topic which uh, I will be addressing uh, today. I'm Pritam Bala. I'm currently associated with MIT School of Bioengineering Sciences and Research, MIT Bio, uh, MIT ADT University, Pune, India. So this topic that I'm going to talk uh, will be structured in a way that I'll be giving a very basic information because I'm sure already we all of us know about nanotechnology some or the other way, but just to give an outline of that, I'll be talking very briefly about uh, what we are dealing with here, about the nanotechnology as a concept. And then straight away, I will dive down to the different works that are going on all around the globe. That will be short section on that. And then straight away, I will dive into the work that we are carrying on, carrying in our institute or I have already done in other institutes I was associated with, which is focusing again on the nanotechnology and drug delivery system. So, and then I will end up with a gist of all that I have talked about and a sweet note, hopefully. So after the entire talk, I'll be taking some of the questions, maybe two or three questions can be taken. Uh, if that is okay with the organizing committee, and then uh, we'll conclude the session of my talk. So, uh, so having said that, let us start with the whole uh, talk process. So this will be more or less around 30 to 35 minutes. So I hope that uh, we all can uh, just dive into the main topic. So now coming back to the presentation as it is, you see the, Entire motivation for this talk is basically can be uh, segregated into these three things, which is uh, obviously the challenge, uh, how to tackle the challenge, the mode, and the goal. So these three are kind of the motivation for this entire talk. The challenge is obviously uh, different diseases. So there are different deadliest diseases all around the globe including the current one, which is the coronavirus. So apart from that, we have significant diseases that, like cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, malaria, tuberculosis, skin diseases, respiratory diseases. Now, subsequently, all these diseases are majorly focused on the South Asian Asian countries. Obviously in West also, we do see a lot of these diseases, particularly the cardiovascular disease or cancer. But overall, if you focus, uh, these are kind of the diseases that we are facing on an everyday basis and we are losing life everyday basis because of these diseases around the globe. So this is our major challenge. Again, just not to forget that currently the one that is going on, the coronavirus is obviously again, one of the major diseases now that we have to uh, tackle. Now to deal with that, we need a mode, a mode of, dealing with these diseases can be the nanotechnology one, which is the theme of this entire conference. So, and then to achieve that, to achieve a nanoparticle-based drug delivery, because so to put it in a very simple format, nanotechnology is nothing but, these nanoparticles are nothing but the cab, like the Ola, Uber, so on, so. And the passenger is basically the drug that we want to deliver it to some particular location. So. That's how the mode works. I'm sure every one of us are aware of that. And ultimately the goal is that we need a good healthcare system and well-being. We want to live well and we want to help others live well and happy and healthy. So this is the entire motto of or motivation of the entire work that has been uh, going on all the way. So now with that, now, when we're talking about nanotechnology, just to start this entire topic is that nanotechnology is not something a uh, new concept. Even though after Richard Feynman started the entire revolution of nanotechnology uh, around 1950s, it seems like it's a new technique, it's a, it's a new concept. Once Richard Feynman gave the idea, once uh, Richard Feynman, after Richard Feynman giving the idea once Drexler, E. Drexler talked more about it, once Taniguchi coined the term nanotechnology. So all this thing happened after 1950s. 
But then it is not a 100, 200 year old concept. The happenings of nanotech started almost 2000 years old. So whether all this glass technology that we see the colored glasses all around our church, mosque, temples uh, in different civilizations, all these techniques that we see, it was all about nanotechnology. Now, the people that time did not know that they are carrying out this kind of adventures. They did not term that as nanotech, but they were doing this kind of work. So this luster of glass technology, uh, wherein this kind of uh, colored glasses were created, were one of the primary examples of uh, nanotechnology. Also, if you talk about uh, particularly uh, Asian scenario, if you see a lot of the, whether it is art, religion, whether it is warfare, Say for an example, art and religion, all the paintings that we see are around our globe, many of those paintings were done using the carbon nanotechnology uh, tech, uh, tech. So also the in the case of warfare, if you see all this wood steel, Damascus steel, all this high uh, potential, high strength and uh, amazingly designed fabrication of this kind of warfare technology was done through nanotech. Uh, architecture wise also, the picture that we see here is one of the amazing architecture of uh, Qutub Minar, which is in Delhi, India, which was a forge building done basically on an iron ore, which is again a nanotech marvel. Now, these are not our focus. Today's our focus, if it is the healthcare, even the healthcare system also, if we talk about nanotech, almost 1,500 BC, we used to have this bhasmas, which is like the Ayurvedic bhasmas or the ashes, which was mixed with a lot of metal and uh, coal powder and other minerals to make it a uh, composite, which was used for different healthcare purposes. Now, this was one of the primary source or uh, primary ideas of nanotech in terms of healthcare that was happening uh, back then. So, whole over this entire idea why i wanted to present that is that this whole idea of nanotech is not something new but yes we are every day we are realizing the the importance of this topic with every invention every effort say for an example past two days we have been listening to many amazing talks uh, where we are seeing the effect of nanotech in terms of healthcare agriculture so and so forth now, coming back to the, the key player of this, the nanoparticles, obviously we all almost know about it, but just to give a brief, nanoparticles are nothing but any particles which is in the range of one to 100 nanometers. And the picture that we're seeing here is basically, it shows from a tennis ball to a water molecule and then check that where our player stands, which is, if you can see in the range of that virus antibody, those ranges, so all our devices that we are going to design has to fall into this category to term it as nano devices, whether it is nanopores, dendrimers, rimers, nanotubes, or CNTs, quantum dots, QDs, so on and so forth. So this is basically what we are dealing with. Now, if you forget the sophisticated properties, the basic property that every of nanoparticle should carry is basically the high S to V ratio, the high surface to volume ratio. Basically, if you take a big chunk and crush it to a smaller ones, the surface area increases, even though their volumes, so the a ratio, the S to V ratio drastically increases uh, when we're talking about nanoparticles. So because of this increased surface area, the reactivity increases. Because of this increased reactivity, basically the whole process becomes faster. So, that is how the nanoparticle is so efficient than a normal particle. And that is why it is able to interact with a different biomolecules on the surface of the cells. And because of its increased surface ratio, the drug absorption is also amazingly increased when, it, when we're dealing with nanoparticles. Uh, and we can design the particles which can diffuse through different system and reach the target area. That is our primary goal to design a cap so that it can deliver the, uh, the passenger to a designated location. So 
Now, this entire thing has to happen without disturbing the basic property of the drug. So the active compound of the drug should not be damaged, but the whole pharmacokinetic property has to be drastic and increased if you're talking about the healthcare system. So that is that, that's how our entire device is designed. Now, this again, the particular top slide basically talks about the entire scales, whether it is a macro scale, micro scale to nano scale. So our focus is on the nano scale. And in this nano scale, we have different nanoparticles as the drug delivery system. Now, once we try to make advancement and make it more sophisticated, it becomes a smarter drug delivery system. So whether it is a liposo, whether it is a silver nanoparticle, whether it is solid lipid SLNs, or whether it is a polymeric one, stem trimers, CNTs. So no matter whatever we make uh, now in this zone of nanoscale, that becomes our uh, target uh, conjugate. Now, in this whole realm of nano devices, we have different particles. It is not only a singular one. We have different amazingly designed particles for different applications. So we can have, uh, for an example, a mesoporous nanocarriers. Now these nanocarriers are basically porous. So in that pores, we can fill in the drug of our interest. So that drug can be anything starting from a simple wound healing drug or a simple drug for headache to a drug for cancer. So anything it can uh, that can hold depending on the application. Now, this kind of nanocarriers also, we can add a lot of surface modification can be done on that. For an example, as you can see, the mesoporous nanocarriers, different target agents can be added so that it can, you can target the particle to a particular location or different surface functionalization can happen so that you can add maybe multiple drugs. So, or maybe you can do something so that it will maintain the pH of the entire conjugate system or it can be a magnetic nanoparticles added and then you can channelize the entire particle to a particular location through out magnet control. So all these things can be done uh, in particularly one of these mesoporous nanocarriers. Now the core shell nanocapsule is another type of nanocarriers that can be used. Now these are all the smart nano devices that we can design particularly. The core shell nanocapsules is one of the simplest one to device but yet uh, much effective. So here we have basically a core where we load the cargo or the biological entity, and we have a surface polymeric matrix. So particularly in this can be used for, used for different biopolymers can be used to make this. So, and then we can also add a surface modification of the target agent to target the entire particle to a particular location. So this is a core shell nanocapsule. We also can have a SLNs, the solid lipid nanoparticles, wherein we have solid lipid core in the center, and then we can have an emulsifier layer on the surface. Or we can have a liposome, where we can use the basic property of this dual uh, layer of this lipid, wherein the hydrophobic and hydrophilic layer, that can be used particularly to load our different drugs inside. Also, we can have something called biomimetic nanoparticles where we kind of mimic the entire biological system. We can have different cell membranes, we can have different pores, different channels, and then inside we can just load our uh, polymeric nanoparticles or the drugs. So now this entire drug basically will be coming out through different pores and channels, same like in our biological cells, it will happen. So it will kind of mimic the uh, biological system. That is what is called the biomimetic nanoparticles. Or we can have one of the primary and most successful uh, way of delivering drug through polymeric uh, matrices or polymeric measles. So wherein we can have a bioactive cargo again in the center, and then we have different block polymers, copolymers around that. Now, if you see in all of that, the surface modifications are there. It is an option. You can make surface modification or you cannot make also depending on the requirement. But the basic idea is taking either this mesoporous nanocarriers, core shells, lipid, solid lipid NPs, liposomes, different biomimetic molecules or polymers. The whole purpose is to make a device, make it smarter so that it delivers the drug, particularly in this kind of scenario in a smart way. 
and controlled way. Now, when you're talking about controlled way, basically we're talking about drug delivery. Now, drug delivery means nothing but taking a drug and delivering it to a particular location. So, administering this pharmaceutical compound to a different location. That is what the entire drug delivery is talking about. Now, it can be either non invasive, invasive, topical, transmucosal, inhalation, any of these routes, the entire drug can be delivered. And then, basically, the problem that in any case, drug delivery is done. So, we are taking a tablet today, it is nothing but drug delivery. But the problem with conventional drug is that once you're sending the drug, it goes through a lot of degradation process and enzymatic uh, treatment in our body. Our body starts secreting a lot of enzymes, the drugs are, gets attached to that and starts degrading. We have to avoid that because we don't always want a drug to be treated right in the mouth itself or the location where we're giving itself. Maybe the desired location is far away from where we're administering. So, to save that drug, we need a proper system. So the whole process is that, the issue with this, that is why the conventional delivery is that first, once we're giving the drug, there's an erratic release. If you're giving a 100 mg of drug, it is seen that immediately it is released, which is not required. So this erratic release, uncontrolled release is a problem. And obviously because there is erratic release, the chances of toxicity is hugely high. And then that is why one of the, say for an example, we're giving an injection or we are giving a lot of more drug, for example, in cancer treatment. So that becomes a patient compliance. Patient doesn't want to go for this kind of heavy load drugs. And that is why the non-specificity of the drug, the non-targeted property of the drug becomes a big issue. Ultimately, the drug is uncontrolled, toxic, and unsustained release. So these are the problems with the conventional drug delivery system. That is where the requirement for nanotechnology-based drug delivery system, smart nanotech drug delivery system comes into the picture. So this particular slide will give an idea of why we require this. It is just that any drug that you give, that drug, if for an example is given through our blood plasma, the drug will be circulated in all our body through blood plasma, our blood. So now once we do that, after administering the drug, there will be ups and downs of the drug concentration in our blood plasma. In conventional system, what we see is that once we give a drug, it goes, it shoots up and then it goes down after some time. So again, to maintain that proper, the controlled level or the therapeutic level, we have to always continuously give the drug to maintain that level. So this is a hazard. This, is, this increases the drug load in the patient body, which is not desired. So to maintain that, we need a system which is controlled, which is long lasting, so that we don't have to administer the drug for a longer period. And it is entirely slow releasing one when, as and when required. So this is the desired profile that we require for which we need a controlled smart drug delivery system. So Controlled means we should have a nanoparticle as we talked about as a device to deliver it. And then we have a target molecule and the drug so that the nanoparticle takes the drug and delivers to the target particular space wherein we want to give. Now the drug nanoparticle can be of all this thing that we talked about, whether it is liposomes, nanoparticles, block polymers, copolymers, dendrimers, so on and so forth. And it should survive different parameters, whether it is uh, pH, enzymes, so on and so forth. So now, as we talked about, we have different nanoparticles. Uh, we have different modes to deliver it. In our work that we will be talking about, uh, we will be talking about particularly taking one biopolymers and check how we can modify that for our own purpose and how we have worked on that to make the modif surface modifications on top of that. So now when you're talking about biopolymers as uh, smart nanoparticles, biopolymers are one of the primary and very interesting uh, candidate for creating a lot of drug delivery devices. Initially, when we had different chemical, uh, chemicals for preparing nano devices, we were suffering from toxicity, non-specificity, uh, targets were not, could not be decided properly. So we needed something which is which will give lesser toxic, which will be more friendly to the body where it is delivered or administered. So that is why we came up with this idea of uh, biopolymers. Now, 
in this biopolymers the, or the polymeric biomolecules, there are a lot of, so these are the different biopolymers that we all have. We have proteins, we have synthetic biopolymers. Uh, under synthetic, we have degradable, non-degradable, we have polysaccharide structures and different biopolymers. In that, we have some novel ones also that we have worked with, which is like Phytoxan and Pululand, which from 1980s, 1990s, a lot of work has started, but still not enough. So slowly we are realizing the importance of these biopolymers in terms of uh, therapeutic efficacy. Uh, now, the application are huge because of these properties of biopolymers. Because it is biopolymer, they are biocompatible. You can form gel, film, anything that you want. Uh, you can make a lot of solid nanostructures like micro needles with these biopolymers. And obviously, it is economical because it is isolated from biological sources. So, whether you can make a film, coating material, targeted drug delivery, or adhesive material, all can be uh, made from these biopolymers. So, it, whether it is a pharmaceutical industry, whether it is a clinical industry or healthcare industry, these biopolymers hold an amazing future. Whether it is anti-cancer therapy, antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal, whether it is a vet medicines or vaccines, anti-tumor, so particularly vaccines means, for example, the COVID vaccine. So anything, any of this thing can, uh, the nanoparticles can be used to make that. That is the, one of the reason the market of biomaterials has increased hugely in past uh, 20 odd years. Now, in our case that we'll be talking about is particularly with one of the unique biopolymer, which is called Pululan, which is uh, a unique biopolymer isolated from the Pululanase. And uh, so this is particularly a polysaccharide biopolymer uh, that consists of uh, maltotriose. So it is isolated from a fungus, which is Aerobacidium uh, Pululans. Now, this particular uh, biopolymer already has been used hugely in many other scenarios. For an example, in the industry, in uh, as a different derivatives or food agriculture industry has used these biopolymers quite a bit in around early 80s, 90s. But particularly pharmaceutical industry was not aware of the potential of this particular compound lot uh, before. But then slowly we are realizing the, the potential of this unique biopolymer. I'm talking about unique because it has different distinct trait, trait like adhesiveness, trait like oxygen permeability. So all these different traits that it has uh, are or, or, or target specificity, organ specificity. So all these things are quite interesting in terms of their property of this particular biopolymer uh, pululan. Now, as I was telling, the properties means we're talking about pululan as a biopolymer, it is non-toxic, it is biodegradable, biocompatible, it is non-immunogenic, it doesn't elicit immune response much. Uh, it's a natural source isolated from, it's non-mutagenic, it doesn't cause mutation in our body, it is non-carcinogenic and oxygen blocking capacity it has. So, so you see, all of these properties can be used individually, each of these properties for making different smart nano devices. The advantage is that because of this unique properties, it's, you can make your ultimate uh, nano device pH responsive. So according to different pHs, it will respond differently. As an example, our body is made up of different pHs. Different place has different pH. The pH of tongue is different than pH of liver. pH of liver is different than pH of blood. So because of this, a single system cannot be used. You have to modify the system according to where we are giving the drug. So that can be done through this kind of unique biopolymers. Uh, it can be organ specific. For example, the pululan can be seen as organ specific to liver. So not, relate, uh, not only confined to this, different biopolymers has that different specificity. So that can be worked upon. Uh, one of the fine property and very interesting one is that we can make pululan hydrophobic or hydrophilic based on their surface modifications. So that something that we have done in our study, which I will show in, uh, in briefly. Uh, and also you can tune the drug whether you want to do a sm smart, fast release or a slow release. So that is where the smart work comes that you can tune the particle according to your requirement and then make different uh, products, whether it is patch, whether it is microneedle, whether it is gel, or whether it is just particles. So any of that you can make through this kind of uh, unique biopolymers. Now, one of the work that we have done, particularly with this pululan is that, uh, now this pululan we have used, if you take a pululan, it is basically a hydro, highly hydrophilic molecule. It dissolves easily. We wanted to uh, prepare a drug a composite that can travel all the way 
two different organs in our body system. So to travel all the way, we needed the drug, the intercomposite to be hydrophobic. But the problem is that even though pululat is organ specific, it is hydrophilic. So we had to make it hydrophobic without changing the property of target specificity. So there, what we did is that uh, we took pululan, we make a surface modification and we made acetylation process through which we make pululan to pululan acetate. Now, surprisingly, now this idea, again, this is a protocol that was done back uh, in early 80s, uh, late 80s by Motozato. But then we, we modified the entire process and we made some changes in the parameters and made that entire process again uniquely different uh, from what where we started with. But ultimately the aim was to make a hydrophobic pululan acetate nanoparticle from a hydrophilic pululan moiety. So after this entire process, what we had is that we had a core shell particle where it, outside we had a hydrophilic outside and inside we had a hydrophobic core. So that hydrophobic core is not totally was ready to load any of the drugs inside. So it was like this, that is why it is like a self-assembled uh, nano composite wherein we can load any of the drug in situ when we are synthesizing it. So this was one of the approach that we made through uh, which we can deliver any drug of our interest. We did a lot of study on this. Once we prepared this particle, we did particularly the hydrophilic hydrophobic test where we wanted to know that whether what we have made is indeed a hydrophobic nature or not. So we found out that it is even after loading the drug, uh, as you can see in the particular slide on the left hand side, uh, even after loading the drug in dr drug loaded fluid acetate nanoparticle was showing hydrophobicity to, in nature because the, the entire angle, the contact angle was not decreased as in the pululan did. Also, we checked out about the particles uh, structures, the morphology through SEM and through DLS, uh, where we checked that the particle was around uh, 38 to 40 nanometer. And after the drug loading, the size increased to around 100 nanometer or so. So, and also with SEM, we confirmed the size and the shape, which was almost in a smooth spherical shape. With AFM also, we corroborated the entire uh, data there. And also with TGA and FGIR, we also found out about the drug loading efficiency and also the bonding. So the bonding was important because we want to know that after the drug loading, because we're calling it a smart drug, the active component of the drug should not be damaged. So the signature of those active components were present in the final component, wherein all the other features were also present. So mostly by hydrophobic or this kind of interactions, the entire drug was attached to the core of this uh, the cell assembled pollutant acid and nanoparticle. Then we did a study where we saw that this entire nanoparticle that we prepared and after the drug loading, the release profile was pH sensitive. So if we talked about this pH 7.2 and pH 4, the acidic and the neutral pH almost, uh, we checked that with neutral pH, the release is much more faster than acidic pH. So that means the whole point was that the entire concept was pH sensitive drug release. So these are the properties that make this kind of nanocomposite a smart one. So not only it is hydrophobic, but also now it is a pH sensitive drug release profile. Our next approach was again to check the same pululan, not the pululan acetate, but the pululan and take some of the drugs and then load it and check, can we use this kind of drug like curcumin or different spices and, uh, uh, and make this entire composite a solid uh, lipid nanoparticle and then attach the drug on the surface of the nanoparticle and then go for the drug delivery system and check the efficacy of that. So now, uh, again, in particular, this example, this experiment or this project that we did, one of the problem was that the, the spices sometimes were not easily dissolvable. So we created a system, we created an entire procedure where we can dissolve this entire uh, spices well and then load it on, on, the, on the surface of the nano composite. Then again, we did a lot of characterization process where we saw that different these particles were, what are the sizes after loading, before loading, the stability also, wherein after one month or two months, if the stability was still intact or not, we found out, yes, it is intact. Then also we found out again, the pH dependent release profile here. For this one, the pH, in, we, can, we also saw that even this particle was pH sensitive 
And then we saw different drug loading cap efficiency where we saw that changing the polymeric ratio, the polymers and the, and the substrate, if you can change that, different conjugates were giving different encapsulation efficiency. So we found out which exact ratio, which formulation was giving us the highest drug loading efficiency. We found out that almost we could reach 83% drug loading efficiency with some of our formulations, which we uh, later used for all other uh, purposes. Now, we also checked about the antimicrobial study, where when we saw that the given formulation that we prepared were gram positive and gram negative in both cases they were showing antimicrobial uh, activity so we checked with different uh, srs b subtilis aeruginosa and fragilis uh, gram negative and gram positive both bacteria we saw that it is indeed uh, antimicrobial we also checked about their mic and bc the uh, inhibitory effect and the bactericidal effect of that and we found out compared to the only spice or only the drug when we prepared a, the a nanoparticle based drug delivery conjugate, that was showing much more increased property in terms of their MIC and MBC. That means with lesser concentration, we were killing more uh, bacteria. So, this was again a good profile that we found out. We, we didn't stop there. We also checked the same formulation for different uh, animal study for toxicity analysis. And we found out that whether it, in terms of acute dermal, the mortality, the skin reaction, the body weight, the LD value, or the necropsy, clinical science, all this we checked in terms of acute dermal, and we checked that, yes, indeed, uh, till 2000 mg per kg, this kind of formulation can be used for uh, different purposes, uh, for their toxic nature was not present even at this range, which is like in UCD guidelines, basically it is category five. So with that high amount of drug also, it does not show uh, particularly the toxic nature. We also did mutagenic study, genotoxicity, the subectodermal study for longer duration exposure of the drug. All this study showed that firstly it is non-toxic uh, and then it is non-mutagenic. It doesn't show any mutagenesis. It was non-abrasional. So basically no chromosomes or DNAs are getting damaged because of the high dose till 2000 mg per kg. And also it is non-clustogenic also. So the cells are intact, the DNAs are intact, there is no chromosomal abrasion and it, there is no DNA mutation happening around, and it is not toxic till 2000 mg per kg, which is really a bigger dose, high dose to uh, consider. So given all this, ultimately we, what we found out is that the, the, the device that we prepared were smart enough, pH responsive, we can tune it to hydrophilicity and hydrophobicity according to our uh, requirement. It is again entirely tunable, uh, so the surface modification, there are a lot of opportunities out there. So all these things are uh, well, uh, the tunability is really good for particularly this kind of. We also did some of the experiment with uh, the silicon nanoparticles with that. So to make it a uh, patch, so basically silicon nanoparticle patch where we loaded the ketoprofen drug and did some study. Now this study was done in DRDO Pune. So, uh, uh, so this entire three works that I have talked about were done in DRDO Pune and some of it we are continuing in, uh, in my current university, which is MIT University here, uh, checking the properties and the surface modifications of this kind of uh, drug and nanocomposites. We published some of the works that I have given, some of the work that has been published uh, taking this uh, entire work, uh, well-established uh, publication houses, and it was quite uh, well appreciated about all the works depending on this taking smart nanomaterials. Uh, now, having said that, the future still holds a lot of work, a lot and lot of work has to be done, whether it in, it in terms of target specificity, to, particularly locate and make the surface changes so that it can go for, to a particular location, or whether it is reliability, that we can make the same kind of nanoparticle again and again with the same procedure, the affordability to make it more affordable for the common people, the lesser toxicity to include more and more uh, from, from a composite to go for pure bio-related uh, bio resources so that it becomes lesser toxic uh, or optimum dose load so that we can decide with lesser load of drug, how we can achieve the more uh, effic efficacy or the surface modification is a huge zone that we have to focus on. And a lot of research has to be done because we are just scratching the surface now. There are a lot of work that has to be done in terms of the nanoparticle based smart drug delivery system. So these are all the future that, that holds in this entire, uh, entire aspect. Now, that is why I say that this is just at least if I'm 
uh, talking from my side, we are just scratching the surface, as I mentioned, that there are huge sea of work that has to be done. A lot of collaborations need to be done. Open space platforms like this, where we can discuss our work, we can see the opportunity that has to be talked about. And ultimately, as I was, as I started with, the whole aim is that we, it's not how, how long we live, but how, how well we live, how healthily we can live our life and uh, we can help others to live their life healthily is the uh, main thing. So, uh, yeah, I think with that, I would like to uh, conclude this particular talk. Uh, I hope that some of the work that has been discussed will be uh, help for some people to come up with new ideas, uh, new collaborations, and uh, to see what avenues can be opened through this smart drug delivery system to tackle different uh, conditions. Yeah, thank you. And again, thanks to the entire uh, fraternity and entire community to be so patiently listening to this talk. And uh, now uh, uh, we can have a small two, three questions uh, that we can answer briefly. Yeah, so, okay. Some of the questions I can see here. So one, one was that what surface modifications can be done? Uh, to these particles. So again, there are ample opportunities, whether it is uh, in terms of hydrophobic hydrophilicity we have discussed, whether in terms of uh, different active components can be attached to that, so that the different receptor based, if you want to deliver it, so that kind of receptors can be attached to that so that you can go and attach on the receptor of some of the cells, for example, liver, lungs, whatever, wherever we're targeting. So every cell has, every tissue has their own receptor. So we can attach the surface, modify those things, uh, to so that you can go and attach there. So whether it is in terms of receptors, uh, sensitivity, in terms of magnetic nanoparticles, like we discussed, so all these things can be uh, options there. Uh, next is what could be the disease of application? Uh, other diseases can be anything. I mean, you can take cancer, you can take you can take any any of the diseases that we see all around us. Any disease can be, all we have to know is that what we are targeting and where we are targeting. So, yeah. Uh, can novel nanoparticle be used for corona? Uh, uh, no, obviously, this is something that just now we found out two, three years back. I mean, hugely it came into our, on our face. So once the vaccine, we know what is the vaccine, what is the structure of the vaccine, obviously we can now create any nano devices to deliver it in our body system. Particularly if it is corona, now it attacks a lot of lung infection. Nowadays, we are seeing the, the black fungus, all different colors of the fungus that we are seeing nowadays. So we do, we will require a huge amount of focus on nanotech-based smart delivery devices to target even the corona or, or the different uh, infectious hereafter. Once we are clear about what vaccines we're talking about, then immediately the focus will be shifting to how we can deliver that vaccine efficiently with lesser amount of dose uh, to save different lives. So yes, the future of nanotech-based uh, anti-COVID uh, vaccine and other infectious uh, infections will be in huge focus in coming few years. Yes, I, I, I feel so, yeah. Okay, I think uh, I am, of the limit now, I'm crossing the time limit. So I think uh, I will, I'd like to stop here. And again, uh, thank you a lot for giving this opportunity to share the smallest work that we have been carrying out here. I'd like to thank all the, my collaborators, all the institutions like DRDO Pune, DIAT, Defense Institute of Advanced Technology Pune, uh, the current university, MIT University, MIT Bio for giving me the platform, the opportunity to work uh, with my little capacity uh, to for the betterment of mankind. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. Oh, we have another speaker from Indonesia, Mondru Jabi from University Najiri Maiden, Indonesia. I visited Maiden uh, 2019, and he's going to talk magnetic field effect on porous coordination polymers synthesis and absorption properties. Dr. Jabi, welcome.
Good morning all. Welcome to SLI International Webinar on the role of nanotechnology in current scenario. So I'm Mondra Zubir from Department of Chemistry, Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Science, Universitas Negeri Medan, North Sumatra, Indonesia. So today I would like to talk about the magnetic field effect on porous coordination polymers or PCP synthesis and their absorption properties. This is the outline of my presentation. I'd like to share the how magnetic field control of the micropore formation on this PCP, zinc to oxec TAZ to water, it's including the structure, properties, and its carbon dioxide absorptivity. And then also I compare with the similar PCPs, which change the TAZ ligand to ATAZ to form the zinc to oxet ATAZ to water, and also observe how the magnetic field effect on crystal structures and pore properties. Besides the inorganic materials or zeolite and carbon materials, now recently the new of porous material is formed as coordination polymers or as well known as the porous coordination polymers or PCPs or metal organic frameworks or MOFs. So this porous coordination polymers was synthesis by self-assembly from the metal ions and organic ligands to form the one-dimensional, two-dimensional, or three-dimensional PCPs. These two-dimensional and three-dimensional PCPs usually form by choose the two kind of organic ligands during the synthesis. Of course, these porous coordination polymers or PCP have some classified. First is the rigid framework. This is the two example of rigid framework PCPs are MIL-100 and MIL-127, which include the FE and CR as the metal ions. But these rigid frameworks have the properties are stable and robust porous framework with permanent porosity. And usually, this, this PCP is an, a normal type one of uh, the absorption isotherm. The second PCP is, is the flexible or dynamic frameworks. This flexible of dynamic framework PCP <clears throat> have the extreme change of the set when the gas molecules are inserted or removed. And they also affected by external stimuli like the change of the temperature of the pressure. This is the one example, the famous example of the flexible or dynamic framework of PCP is pre-ELM11. So this pre-ELM11, initially by carbon dioxide absorption, no carbon dioxide absorbed in initial stage. But then after the high, higher the pressure, then they have the hysteristic absorption or also the hysteristic desorption. So this is the, the one of the properties of this flexible dynamic formula. They have excited the stepless absorption for the hysteristic absorption. The second PCP is, is the open metal side PCPs. These open metal sites can enhance the gas absorption after the metal ion, the open, uh, the open the metal, the metal side of the PCPs. The fourth of PCPs is the surface functionalized framework. The surface functionalized framework contains the gas interaction site as function as the functional group, such as the amine or hydroxyl group. It can enhance the capacity and the selectivity for gas absorption, especially for carbon dioxide. So interaction between the, the functional group and the carbon dioxide gas can enhance the selectivity, the absorptivity 
of carbon dioxide. And beside the catalyst or biosensor, so I use this application of PCP as the gas storage. So in this experiment, we do for the nitrogen absorption for four properties observed, and then the carbon dioxide absorption. And how magnetic field effect during the synthesis and also including the absorption properties. So if we synthesize the PCPs at zero tesla or no magnetic field, so the crystal drop disorder. Besides that, if you prepare in magnetic field, the crystal drops slowly and form the order crystal structure. And previously in since University of Japan at 2008, they they successful to prepare the one of PCP CU PZDC PYZ. And when the paper at zero Tesla, this PCP form as five coordination number of PCP and then change to six coordination numbers when the paper at magnetic field six Tesla. So in this experiment, I observe how the magnetic field control of the micropore formation of the zinc offset tiazid water. So this this in first in this first PCP we use TAZ with the water and also the water the water solvent. So the magnetic field will observe how the effect in structure properties and also the absorption. So this is the experimental stage of this uh, exper uh, research. This is material used for metal ion zinc. We use from zinc carbonate basic, and then the two two ligand tools for this this synthesis. First, is one two four triazole for triazole ligand, and then oxalic acid for the second ligand, and then we use the methanol and this distilled water as a solvent during the synthesis. And this is the PCP synthesis stage. So all zinc metal ion. Oxalic acid and triazole mixture of 12 milliliter methanol and 2 milliliter water and heat it at 453 Kelvin for 12 hours in outer craft system. After 12 hours, cooling the system to room temperature and then filter the crystal form. And for purification, washing with the methanol and water. And then the final stage dry at room temperature. And then the PCP we, we characterized by XRD, sand, and also the pore properties observed by nitrogen absorption isotherms at 77 Kelvin, and then carbon dioxide CO2 absorption isotherms at 303 Kelvin. This is the PCP synthesis design outside the magnetic field. So no magnetic field used in this for synthesis. So this this all the metal ion first and the second ligand mixture in the, in this sample vessel with vessel cap and then insert to autoclave autoclave system and stay for 12 hours. And this is the PCP synthesis inside the magnetic field. So the previously slide is the synthesis outside the magnetic field considered as zero Tesla. And in this magnetic field, this autoclave system insert to magnetic field and then set the magnetic field as two Tesla, four Tesla, and six Tesla. And this is absorption isotherm measurement. We use the volumetric absorption isotherm apparatus and before the absorption isotherm measurement based on the PGDTA analysis, the solvent was removed around the 110 degrees Celsius. So before the, the absorption measurement, we do the pretreatment temperature in two stages, initial stage at the 333 Kelvin for one hour, and then continue at 
383 Kelvin for 12 hours. And then after the treatment temperature, temperature, the absorption measurement for nitrogen and carbon dioxide, nitrogen absorption at 77 Kelvin, and then carbon dioxide at 303 Kelvin. So this is the XRD pattern the, for the, and the crystal structure of zinc oxide chiazid paper under various magnetic fields. And if compare this one Tesla, zero Tesla, two Tesla, four and six Tesla, if we source from the, this XRD patterns, it looks like not significant difference between the zero Tesla and six Tesla XRD patterns. But the two, for two Tesla and four Tesla, it looks like slightly change of the XRD pattern, especially for the highest peak at this zero Tesla. It consider that the lower the six Tesla magnetic field, the significant change of XRD at the structure was performed when the paper under magnetic field. And by <clears throat> this is the zinc to oxide, PZ to water crystal structure. We saw that the metal ion, zinc metal ion, combined <clears throat> with the triazol ligand and oxalic acid ligand and form five coordination number of PCPs. Okay, this is the uh, some observation from the XRD patterns which we saw that the two Tesla and four Tesla have the sum of the inten intensity change in sum of two Tesla at two theta position. So this peak intensity change then perform to by using the Expo 2015 analysis. And we get that the zero Tesla, even zero Tesla and six Tesla crystal not significant XRD, the XRD patterns, but the crystal, the crystal system changed from monoclinic to triclinic crystal. And interestingly, the two Tesla and four Tesla with significant change of the XRD pattern, <coughs> it looks like a slightly same two Tesla with zero Tesla and four Tesla with, a two, uh, with six Tesla. It suggests that the, when zero Tesla changed to six Tesla, two Tesla and four Tesla looks like the intermediate case before change from monoclinic to triclinic. And this is the same image for all magnetic field crystal. You can see the morphology of crystal change from zero Tesla, two Tesla, four Tesla, and six Tesla. Example. The two Tesla and four Tesla, it looks like similar morphology. Then one, but zero Tesla and six Tesla, it looks like a significant change of the morphology. So it's supported by the XRD pattern that two Tesla and four Tesla <coughs> have the sum uh, intensity change for XRD patterns. Also injures this slightly change of the morphology before change from zero Tesla to six Tesla. So this is the, the the one Tesla and six Tesla comparison with a for same image. And you can see the zero Tesla crystal form as this or the crystal change to rectangular shape of the six Tesla crystal and also the smoothly surface of the crystal. So to, to investigate the four properties of these PCPs. We, we observe by nitrogen absorption isotherms for zero Tesla and six Tesla. <clears throat> and the first, the, this is the temperature or pretreatment temperature before the absorption. So we measure without the pretreatment temperature, temperature and also with three hours, six hours and 12 hours pretreatment time. And for zero Tesla, when the pretreatment, no pretreatment time and only three hours, the pretreatment temperature, it's, it's the, the pore not yet formed. 
if compared with six Tesla, you got the pretreatment temperature and also six hours and 12 hours, the core already formed for this magnetic field to start. That is compared by the by the other magnetic field, we, it's shown also the same phenomena for magnetic field to start. It's the four Tesla without the pretreatment temperature already form the, the core of the crystal. So we, we consider that this magnetic field crystal, especially for four Tesla and six Tesla, have the form as hydrophobic type of thermos. Because with the pretreatment temperature, the pore formation already occurred in this crystal. If compared with the zero Tesla with the with the pretreatment temperature, in this in this zero Tesla crystal, should we remove the sulfur first to form the the framework of the cities? And the second the second phenomena we observe that this this rectangular set of the type one of isotherm absorption is considered as the homogeneous point. So to to prove this to this <coughs> hypothesis, we do the solvent loss measurement by gravimetric method. And this initial stage, the first stage, it's only vacuum, vacuum pump at the 298 Kelvin for 10 minutes. So only by vacuum pump for the 298 Kelvin for 10 minutes, for all magnetic field crystal can already can remove the solvent if compared with zero Tesla. The zero Tesla after five and four hours, the, the solvent does um, <clears throat> gradually decrease or, or remove from the crystal. So we consider that this magnetic field crystal form as hydrophobic type of framework. And to investigate the core, the core properties of this magnetic crystal and without the magnetic field crystal, it's a pore volume crystal observed by various pretreatment time and various magnetic field. And you can see the zero Tesla, the zero Tesla crystal from the have the pore volume after three hours, but the magnetic field crystal or two Tesla, four Tesla, and six Tesla already form the porosity without uh, without the without the pretreatment temperature. Made. And then if you compare the magnetic field, this magnetic field two Tesla and four Tesla have also the the specified the pore volume if compared with zero Tesla and six Tesla. So it's considered if it's, uh, it's supported by the extra deep pattern intensity change before <clears throat> for two Tesla and four Tesla to start. And then for car this is the carbon dioxide absorption isotherm of zinc oxide TNZ. And we can check the zero Tesla, four Tesla, and six Tesla crystal with pretreatment temperature for 12 hours and no pretreatment temperature. It, this is the as synthesized crystal. But the zero Tesla, it cannot absorb the carbon dioxide when the, when the absorption isotherm without use the pretreatment temperature. And but the four Tesla is likely a slightly amount of carbon dioxide absorbed without pretreatment temperature. But after but the the interesting for six Tesla already already absorbed the CO2 even no pretreatment temperature. Then after 12 hour pretreatment temperature, the six Tesla also absorbed the highest carbon dioxide if compared with zero Tesla and four Tesla. And then the second, the second similar PCP also synthesis as zinc oxide ATZ. So I changed the TAZ ligand to ATAZ 
and also observe how the magnetic field effects on crystal structures and properties. So this is the strategy why I changed the second ligand from TAZ and uh, to ATAZ because the gas storage capacity in PCPs can be enhanced in various ways, such as first it can increase in the surface area, the surface area increasing based on the the size of gas will absorb inside the framework of PCPs. But the second strategy is functionalizing organic income. So some report, some paper was reported that the amine group can enhance this carbon dioxide absorption. So in this, this triazole ligand, we inserted the amine group as the gas interaction site with the carbon dioxide to increase this carbon dioxide absorption. Okay, in this in this study, we chase the amino triazole because uh, triazole become three amino one two four triazole, and then also we use the same first ligand is oxalic acid. So crystal structure of zinc two oxide triazid and zinc two oxide triazid it's formed as the similar PCPs, so not significant different. Or zinc, both of the PCP form as five coordination num number of PCP with zinc metal ion bind with the two tri three triazole and two oxalic acid. But in <coughs> if we observe the framework of four properties of these two kind of PCPs. If for zinc TAZ, if the pore, the pore framework will no contain the functional group, but in this zinc offset TAZ, inside the framework, they contain the amine group, the amine group inside in the, in the pore. So it's possibility will help to capture the carbon dioxide because the strong Van der Waals interaction between the carbon dioxide with the amine group. This is the experimental space for the second PCPs. Also, we use the same metal ion zinc carbonate basic and then three amino triazoles, first ligand, oxalic acid, the second ligand, and two pleasure methanol and distilled water. Or for the south end. Also, the characterization performed by XRB, SEM, and nitrogen absorption isotherms for four properties. And this is the, the PCP synthesis, also the stem stage between the PAZ and APAZ ligand. So, all the metal ion and ligand mixture of 12 milliliter methanol and 2 milliliter water and then keep it at 180 degrees for 12 hours in autoclave and then cooling to after 12 hours cooling to room temperature and then the filter the filter crystal form washing with the methanol and water and dry at room temperature for one day and then we do the characterization the characterization by xrd and also the four properties observed by nitrogen and carbon dioxide absorption. And the same also, this is PCP synthesis under magnetic field. Also, we measure at the one we synthesize at zero Tesla, two Tesla, four Tesla, and also six Tesla. And this is the XRD patterns of zinc offset ATAZ under magnetic field. And similar with zinc offset TAZ, in between the zero Tesla and six Tesla, this looks like not significant different. So we consider these two kind of PCP, TAZ and ATAZ ligand, have the serious effect the, uh, on the structure by magnetic field at long magnetic field, or two Tesla and four Tesla, lower than six Tesla, because the six Tesla magnetic field crystal not significant different with zero Tesla. Even though, <coughs> even the, the highest intensity for six Tesla higher than zero Tesla. And the difference of the this the second PCP is compared with TAZ, if TAZ changed from monoclinic to triclinic, 
and this this uh, PCPs, zero Tesla and six Tesla form as the same crystal system. Are is our thermic, but the two Tesla and four Tesla with significant change of the intensity of extra dependence change to tricyclic system. And if compared the same image of this zinc oxide ATZ, in the presence of a main group induced the interesting morphology for its magnetic field to start. For zero, this is the zero Tesla magnetic field morphology, and then change to two Tesla. It looks like the particle size is increased the, then to a zero Tesla. And then four Tesla crystal with significant change for exhibition also have the significant image change of morphology. So the, and then six Tesla, it looks like make a cubic cubic shape if compared with the four Tesla as the rectangular shape. And this is the isotherm isotherm measurement, the same system used for this uh, absorption isotherm with the previously PCP, we use the volumetric absorption absorption process, and also we do the pre-treatment temperature with the same states, initial states at 333 Kelvin for one hour, and then continue to 383 Kelvin for 12 hours. And also nitrogen absorption will be measured at 77 Kelvin, and carbon dioxide at 303 Kelvin. And this is the nitrogen absorption isotherm of Z offset ATZ. So it's on all zero Tesla and magnetic field crystal cannot absorb the nitrogen phase. It suggests the pore formation is disturbing by the presence of amine group inside the pore. But interestingly, for CO2 absorption, <coughs> the interaction between CO2 and amine group induces the significant amount of carbon dioxide capture in the framework. So this is the left side for zero hours pretreatment time, no pretreatment time, and this is pretreatment time at 110 for 12 hours. And zero Tesla and six Tesla that have the same exactly pattern cannot absorb the, the carbon dioxide at the low pressure uh, below the 400 torr, but after 300, at, after 400 torr, it significant increase the for the absorb, the CO2 absorption amount. But especially for two Tesla and four Tesla, which change the extra pattern, they can absorb the carbon dioxide in, uh, with significant amount. It considered that the interaction of the CO2 and amine group increase in this two Tesla and four Tesla magnetic field. And then for after pretreatment time at the 110 degrees Celsius for 12 hours, only two Tesla have the slightly intensity of the, uh, slightly the amount of the CO2 can absorb. If compared with no pretreatment, it looks like the structure, the composition, or change because they are by the heat at 110 degrees for 12 hours. Besides that, on the other hand, for zero Tesla and six Tesla, they have the higher CO2 absorption amount. And six Tesla in content, uh, in, can absorb the CO2 absorption highest than zero Tesla, two Tesla, and four Tesla. And this is the performance of CO2 absorption isotherms that at three low pressure, 350 torr, and then 760 torrs. So if you compare it two Tesla and four Tesla at low pressure, they induce this strong interaction at low pressure around the 350 torr. But after increasing the, the pressure to 760, the, in the for two Tesla, it looks like, it's look like um, have the decomposition of structure because the presence of a mangrove 
So the, the absorption of carbon dioxide is lower than the other space star. But for six Tesla, by high pressure, have the strong interaction between the carbon dioxide and the combine. And this is we, we try to make the zinc oxide adjacent core model people under magnetic field. So we consider based on the CO2 absorption and also the characterization data from XRD and same image. So this is the, the model for of zinc oxide adhesive for zero Tesla and six Tesla. So the amine, the amine group uh, interaction between the amine group and the carbon dioxide, it looks like zero Tesla and six Tesla have the, the work for space and the rigid structure stability. But for two Tesla and four Tesla, the force force for space it looks like narrow and for Tesla maybe very narrow if we observe from the absorption data. And we consider this two Tesla and four Tesla crystal form as the flexible structure stability. Okay, then if <clears throat> this is the conclusion and the outlook of this research that the zinc offset ATZ and TZ two Tesla and four Tesla magnetic field solves the new crystal structure for ATZ two Tesla and four Tesla. If it looks not stable structure observed by XRD pattern and IR spectra. And then also the ATZ two Tesla and four Tesla solve the significant amount of magnetic related to high of CO2 absorption, even no pretreatment temperature. And also the zinc oxide ATZ2 Tesla and 4 Tesla observe significant change of amine group after 12 hour pretreatment at 110 Celsius. Okay, thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, that is, that's all my presentation. And then we maybe we can open for the discussion. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hello, once again, we have one more speaker, Kuda Anang from the University of Malaysia, Kalantan. She is going to deliver a talk on character characterizing the removal of water and wastewater pollutants with agro waste delivered nanomagnetic absorbent composites. Welcome you, madam. Please deliver your talk. Assalamu alaikum and hi, I am Huda from UMK. I would like to deliver my lecture entitled Characterizing Removal of Water and Wastewater Pollutant with agro waste derived Nanomagnetic Adsorbent Composite. So first and foremost, we look at the scenario, which is water pollution. So in Malaysia, Thai pollution is a significant issue, especially in Kelantan and Terengganu. Why Kelantan and Terengganu that are chosen in my studies? Because both states are having bate industry, which is a traditional craft that involves ties. So the problems with this industry is untreated effluent has been discharged into water resources that disturb aquatic animals and and also brings carcinogenic to humans. So, based on a report by Kelantan Department of Environment, party industry in Kelantan has the lowest level of compliance towards the department's regulations and law. Commercial dye is often being used in industry because it is cheaper and also it is chemically stable. For example, Raymazo, Brilliant Blue Art, Art BBR, and also Redamin 6G, known as Art 6G. So, this textile dye has specific characteristic, which is it is chemically stable and also resistance towards degradations. So, with these two characteristics, it makes it very difficult to remove dye from the solutions. So, we will have a look for the dye that will be used in this study. First is Remazo Brilliant Blue R, or known as Blue 19. 
it is a hydrophobic blue dye that widely used in textile, lab and dyeing process. It is classified as an ionic and trichinone dye and RBBR contain four benzene rings and RBBR is resistant to chemical oxidation and it has stabilized resonance aromatic and trichinone structure. For the second dye, here is rhodamine 6G or R6G. So rhodamine 6G is an azo dye and it is chemically stable, recalcitrant due to chromophoric characteristics. So exposure to rhodamine 6G is detrimental to health and also it can cause allergic dermatitis as well as severe damage to nervous systems. Since we will use biocarbon as part of our studies, so we will discuss about biocarbon that derive from agro waste. So what is bicarbon? Bicarbon is basically is a carbon rich, porous, fine grain derived from carbonaceous biomass through limited air thermal decomposition process. So biocarbon surface normally is negative. Why? Because it is due to dissociations of functional groups containing oxygen. And why in this study we use coconut waste? Because it is a potential carbonaceous biomass and also it is abundant, high biodegradability and also low cost. So in this study, the agro waste derived biocarbon or we call it a CS will be uh, mixed with nanomagnetic properties. Why we add nanomagnetic properties into biocarbon we call it SCS? Because before we run experiments, we discover that this advantage of powdered biocarbon, which is it's very difficult to be separated in downstream process, especially in the solutions, and it also cause production of secondary pollutions. So we think and then we discover that the magnetic properties able to facilitate the separations of bicarbon from aqua solutions. So among the magnetic properties, we try to use another approach, which is applications of iron oxide nanoparticles. So how it works, so it adsorbs contaminant rapidly due to stronger ferromagnetic properties dispersed homogeneously in solutions. So since we are using iron oxide nanoparticles, so we will have a look at magnetism of iron oxide nanoparticles. So the quantum mechanical property of electron spin that has vital role from magnetism, this is because most of the outer shell of electron in the bulk material are occupied in bonding pair electron, later become non-magnetic. So reduction of electron coordination with nanoscale magnetic structure will provide more available electron from magnetism. Therefore, it provides greater propensity of magnetic behavior. So basically, in this lecture, I'll focus on four aspects, which is consists of characteristics that will be determined through analysis, consists of XRD, SEM, and FTIR. And then for isotherm, we look at the Langmuir, Leak and Temkin isotope models, and then we look at the kinetics, including pseudo first order, pseudo second order, and intraparticle diffusions. And also, we will discuss a little bit about the mechanisms that involve in the adsorption process. Where we look at the first analysis, which is XRD. So, based on the slides that are shown here, it shows that intense peak positions of hematite, magnetite, and also vestite. So, the nano size material of CS was identified through XRD analysis and the obtained results that I mentioned before depicted the presence of iron oxide nanoparticles. So, these iron oxide nanoparticles that exist in the CS consists of magnetite, megamite, hematite, and vestite are having strong ferromagnetic behavior. Okay, we go for a second analysis, which is scanning electron microscopy analysis. So, in this analysis, we will look at the structure and morphology of CS. So, the image here shows dispersion of iron oxide nanoparticles embedded on the CS metric aggregations, which is highlighted in the red circle there. 
So what happened here? This condition actually indicates good mechanical binding between CS matrix and iron oxide nanoparticles. So we go for the third analysis, which is FDRR analysis. In this analysis, we will go for scanning the functional groups that involve and also exist on the surface of CS. So the chemical structure and functional groups of CS before and after adsorptions are depicted in the figure which we can see here at the left side for our BBR and also for the right side is r 6 g So in order to get the results, the maximum wavelength 4000 cm to minimum wavelength 400 cm were used to scan the available functional groups that exist on the surface of CS. So first and foremost, we will go for the left side, which is the RBBR. So what happened to RBBR? So the RBBR here, the functional groups that commonly exist on the CS surface are alcohol group, carbonyl group, alkene group, and FEO known as rustide. So this analysis also can prove the difference between commercialized activated carbon and also CS. So I would like to highlight the difference between commercial activated carbon and also CS, which is the existence of FEO or known as Wustite stretching bands that only present in CS instead of uh, CAC. So the presence of CS at wavelength 536.98 cm confirming that the uh, ion site nanoparticles exist on the surface of CS. In this figure also, we can see the presence of inorganic nitrites, amine and sulfoxides stretching on CS after RBBR adsorptions. So this proves that CS can trap dry molecule in pores to remove dye from aqueous solutions. So now we let's see the figure for R6G on the right side. The peak at 1988.94 cm which is correspond to aldehyde group before adsorptions, it's actually shift to 1845.52 cm after adsorptions. So why this happened? It's actually explaining that the CS adsorption indeed. So, so the shift of peaks actually indicates that there are interactions between the active site or surface of CS and also R6G. Apart from that, the shift of hydroxy group and FEO group vibration peak before and after adsorption also affirm information of hydrogen bond during the adsorption reactions. We have a look for the second aspects that we will discuss in this lecture which is the isotherm part. So adsorption isotherm was used to determine first we want to determine the type of adsorption molecules distribute on the surface of the adsorbent and secondly we want to see the interaction between adsorbent and adsorbate and also the third is we want to see the expressions of the surface properties of adsorbent at equilibrium state. Why we did isotherm study? Because we want to predict the adsorption behavior for different adsorption system. Here we got three models, which is first Langmuir, Frundlich, and also Tamke model. The first isotherm model, which is Frundlich isotherm. This model is commonly used to describe adsorption characteristics on heterogeneous surface. So there are a few considerations of parameters for Frundlich isotherms, which is the first is KF. So KF is an approximate indicator of adsorption capacity. And also for the second one is 1 over N, which is a function of strength of adsorptions in the adsorption process. So what happened? 
if n equals to 1, that means the partition between the two faces are independent of the concentrations. But if n greater than 1, it indicates that reaction is high affinity towards occurrence of chemisorptions between adsorbent and also adsorbate. Second one, which is the Langmuir isotherm. So, Langmuir isotherm describes quantitatively the formation of monolayer adsorbate on the outer surface of CS, which is the adsorbent. And after that, no further adsorption takes place. So, the Langmuir model is valid for monolayer adsorption onto a surface containing finite number of identical sites. In this um, model, Langmuir model, there are assumptions are made. First, uniform energy adsorption onto the surface, and also the second one, which is no transmigration of adsorbate in the plane of the surface. So, the considered parameters for Langmuir isotherm first is RL, which is a dimensionless constant referred to as a separation factor or equilibrium parameter. So, RL values indicate the adsorption nature to be either first favorable if RL is in between 0 and 1 and second unfavorable if RL less than 1 and third linear if RL equals to 1 and irreversible if RL equals to 0 and the second one is QM which is known as maximum uptake capacity so for the third isotherm which is Temkin isotherm Temkin isotherm contains a factor that explicitly taking into account of adsorbate and adsorbent interactions. So, by ignoring the extremely low and large values of concentrations, the assumptions of Tenkim Asatom's model is heat of adsorption, which is function of temperature of all molecules in the layer, would decrease linearly rather than logarithmic with coverage. So, the parameters in this model are B, which is Temkin isotherm constant, and also Kt, which is Temkin isotherm binding constant. After we conduct an experiment to determine which model can be fit into the adsorption reactions for each of the dye, so how we want to see and how we want to compare which one is the most fitted one so this time we will look at the highest regression value so based on the obtained result here it shows that the most fit uh, model for rpbr is langmuir because it has the highest regression value which is 0 0.997 one. So, what does it mean? So, it means that uh, the Langmuir model describes the adsorptions of small porous material, especially the biocarbon. So, it indicates that adsorption took place by forming an adsorbate monolayer on the outer surface of the adsorbent. So here, no multilayer forms as no further adsorptions took place. Since Langmuir isotherm has another parameter, which is RL, so we can see uh, either the adsorption is favorable or not. Based on the obtained result for RBBR, it indicates that adsorption was favorable because the RL value was in between 0 and 1. So, based on the obtained result also for R6G, it is shows that uh, friend like was the most fit model with higher regression value. And the end value, which is 2.208, was high enough for separation. And this is not only indicate, it is uh, shows that RX6J removal favored frontalite isotope model, but it also reflects a multi layered adsorption process on heterogeneous surface. So, this kind of adsorption process on heterogeneous surface has another advantage, which is the adjacent carbon atoms 
uh, will provide interaction with the adsorbing molecules. Another aspect that will be uh, discussed in this lecture is the kinetic. So kinetic study describes as the mechanism of adsorption and determine potential rate controlling. The dynamic of adsorption process in terms of order rate constant can be determined through kinetic adsorption data. So mostly applied models including uh, pseudo first order, pseudo second order, and intraparticle diffusions. The pseudo first order will indicate for physics options, meanwhile pseudo second order for chemist options. Based on the obtained result for RBBR, it shows that pseudo second order gives the highest regression value, which is 0 0.9966. That means pseudo second order was the best fit kinetic model for RBBR. It is also indicates that the adsorption process of RBBR and CS was chemisorption and also involved valence process by sharing or exchanging electrons. Okay, for the R6G, it also shows that pseudo second model showed the excellent correlation coefficient with high R squared. Apart from that, the pseudo second order also shows high proximity between values of experimental capacity, which is 14.445 mg gram, and also calculated uptake, uptake capacity, which is 15.1515 mg per gram. So this shows that the adsorptions are 6G also controlled by chemisorptions. And finally, we got to see the mechanisms part. So mechanism in mechanisms, the aggregation of ion oxide nanoparticle influence electron exchange. So in this figure, it shows that valence forces are involved in chemisorption process to create such interactions consists of either hydrogen bonding and electrostatic interactions. So this uh, chemisorption process are occurred by sharing or exchanging electron between the dyes and also surface of CS. So based on our uh, discussions on this topic, we will see that, for example, R6G dye. Uh, when we look at the isotherm that fit for R6G, it is front leg. Um, that normally front leg is used for um, determining the physics options as well. But when it goes for kinetic studies, it's quite contradict because the kinetic studies shows that chemist options also occur. So when we look back the end value, so we can see that the end value of the front leak isotherm of art 6 g is favorable for chemisop. And we can see that, we can say that the situation is likely due to the valence electrons on the surface of atom of iron oxide nanoparticles. So it's very interesting to see and to realize that iron oxide nanoparticles has very great influence in adsorption process, either in kinetic and also in adsorption isotherms. So that's all for me. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, at the end of second day webinar, we are uh, proposing formal word of thanks. On behalf of the organizing committee, we are thankful to our chief Patton, Raja Reddy, Patton, Professor Sundaravalli, Rector, Professor Hussain, Register, for making this event happen for permitting us to do this SLA International Webinar. We are also thankful to our beloved principal, Professor N. Savitram Magaru, for being uh, our main secretary of this event 
and also allowing me allowing me to talk on uh, vote of thanks for giving me opportunity uh, to thank all of you today our speakers first speaker from university of malaysia kalantham halsen s abdullah gave wonderful talk thank you sir we are also thankful to pritam bala from mit for readily accepting and del uh, delivering a talk on novel nanoparticles a smart drug delivery system nowadays drug delivery plays a very key role so uh, wonderful talk to her delivered sir thank you very much sir for you and also to mit so we have another speaker from indonesia that is mundra jubeef from university nagiri medan indonesia uh, thank you sir you have delivered a wonderful talk today we are thankful to you and as well as to your university for giving a nice opportunity in the webinar finally we have huda ong from university of malaysia kelantan uh, for uh, we are highly thankful to you being a research scholar you could be able to deliver a good talk uh, we are highly thankful to you once again we are thankful to all our collaborators technical partners media partners and supporters and special thanks to our technical team mr sankar who could able to spend a lot of time in uh, up upscaling your videos and also making uploading this the youtube channel and uh, making it available to all of us so we are highly thankful to you sankar and uh, once again on behalf of organizing committee i also thankful to the to department of botany sri venkatesh university and all the faculty non teaching staff and research scholars making this happen from the department of botany sri venkatesh namaste thank you very much